Hello, comrades, and finally, welcome back to another episode of Thinking Out Loud. Um, those of you who have been following me on social media know that I've had some pretty big life changes recently. As you can see, the studio's looking a little bit different now. Uh, but we kind of got everything locked into place here, and I'm excited, and I'm ready to get out here and start producing more content for you guys. Um, I won't bore you with any of the details of that. Just know I'm excited to be back here. I'm going to try to get into a new routine, um, and I'm going to be experimenting with a little bit of a change uh, with the channel. I know you guys are used to more long-form stuff, um, an hour, an hour and a half sometimes when I do a deep dive analysis. I will still be doing some of those sometimes. Um but I'm going to try and reel back a little bit and do some shorter videos as well, some quicker analysis with less sources and things like that, just kind of more rapid fire. Um, just experiment with that. Um, you know, during this time, during this life transition, I've been focusing on trying to do some things that are better. For me, you know, I've been an activist and uh, independent media analysis personality or whatever the hell you want to call it, um, you know, pretty much my whole adult life. And a part of that has entailed not taking care of myself, so I've been trying to do that here. Um, so we're going to try some of these shorter videos and see how they fit. You know, drop comments, let me know what you think about them, let me know what kind of content you want to see. Um, but without further ado, without any more disclaimers or any of that, we're going to go ahead and jump in today's video. So obviously, in the last month, we have seen an ap absolutely horrific, egregious attack on the Palestinian people, a genocide on the Palestinian people. Um, one of the things I've been doing during this time, don't think I've just been sitting here quietly doing nothing. Um, I have done, been to several actions during this period. Um, but you know, we have seen absolutely egregious war crimes, horrific crimes against humanity perpetuated by the Israeli government on Palestinian people, something we've seen the entire duration of the uh, Israeli Zionist state, right? Um, but you have experts um, in press and officials from different NGOs and everything saying that this is perhaps one of the worst atrocities in the long history of the um, apartheid and genocide on Palestinian people. Um, so obviously with that, we have seen many independent uh, media personalities, uh, orga independent media organizations from Breakthrough News to Ben Norton to Lee Camp, whoever it is you're watching covering this topic. Um, um, and I obviously, this is an issue important to me um, as well. And I wanted to do some coverage on it, but I mean, you have all these independent media channels covering things, you know, rapid fire as they are happening, you know, and that's obviously not something I can compete with due to, you know, being a father, uh, having to work full time and things like that. So I thought I would do some coverage on a different aspect of this Israel Palestine thing. And um, as the name of the video suggests, I'm going to be discussing today from a couple of sources how just another way in which the Israeli state, the Zionist state, is a rogue regime on the world stage. Um, you know, we see consistently with Israel, it consistently votes against. UN resolutions on humanitarian, uh, on human rights, um, on democracy, on things like this, um, and always perpetually, of course, allies with the United States, uh, considering that Israel is essentially a colonial possession, uh, a colonial extension of the United States, right, and is completely complicit in U.S. war crimes. We have seen this throughout history. You know, we have the relations between um, the Israeli military, Israeli state, Israeli police, and training police here in the U.S. who then go on to do uh, horrible hate crimes against black and brown people. There's a long list, a uh, long history of Israel acting as a rogue state on the global stage. Um, but what I want to talk about today is Israel's uh, law of return, which some of you may have heard of. Um, the law of return is this idea that Israel has this legislation, this policy that Israel has where if you are Jewish of Jewish ethnicity, I'm not sure how they determine the genetic, really quite eugenic uh, perspectives or, or parameters for that. But essentially, the law of return is if you are Jewish, you can come and live in Israel and become a citizen in Israel and the government of Israel help you get a job, help you go to school, help you get a home and things like that, right? 
Um, so we're going to be discussing how that right of return, that law of return, has been used by all sorts of criminals to use Israel as a safe haven, to escape justice uh, on the global stage from whatever country they're from, right? So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into the source material here, guys. I have a couple articles here, but I've um, tried my best to sort of minimize the amount of things that are highlighted so we can just have more of a discussion on it, try to make this quicker, more rapid fire. Um, this is from Jacobin. It says, Israel's law of return lets criminals abroad run from the law. Israel routinely refuses to extradite its own citizens, including people who've flown there purely to escape justice. Its law of return rewards criminals who can claim a vague connection to Israel, even as it denies innocent Palestinians their homeland. So, of course, this is one of the big hypocrisies of this uh, law of return in general, but especially when it comes to sheltering criminals. And as we'll see, the the criminal the criminals that Israel does shelter refuse to extradite range anything from s sex offenders, war criminals. Uh, um, extortionists and fraudsters. It's absolutely crazy the amount of people that they'll hide and refuse to extradite, right? Um, so that's one of the big hypocrisies of this is they'll shelter, they'll take anyone in that has, like it says here, any vague connection to Israel, any vague connection to Jewish ancestry. Meanwhile, you have Palestinians um, who have lived there for generations and remembered Palestinians are Muslim, they are Christian, they are also Jewish, they are the Palestinian people. Um, you have people in the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, or obviously Gaza Strip, who have essentially zero rights within the Israeli state. Even Palestinians that are in historical uh, Palestine, his, uh, Israel, that was created in 1948, have essentially a second-class apartheid relationship to the state, right? Um, and it's just absolutely hypocritical almost to a cartoonish level that Israel will not grant any rights to these people, will completely deny them their human rights in all these different ways. But then criminals that have never been to Israel ever in its history um, can fly there and refuse to be extradited and can even get citizenship, right? So let's go on here with the reading, guys. It says, the so-called Tinder swindler, a fraudster from Tel Aviv who made millions running what can only be described as a Ponzi scheme of women. Going on here, talking about the documentary involving this guy, you probably heard about this. This was pretty huge in the headlines for a while, pretty pretty big in the popular cultural circuit, the Tinder swindler. Um, t discussing the documentary that covered it, it says, The d documentary is compelling, if sinisterly so. Lviv now lives openly in Tel Aviv slash Jaffa, despite still being wanted for his crimes by authorities in Britain, Sweden, and Norway. So he's wanted by three different countries, right? Uh, but behind his own status as a wanted man, indeed, in states that count as Israeli allies, is a persistent story of criminals using Israel as a hideout in which to evade justice elsewhere. But for all the myriad examples of abuse of extradition procedure, the claim by the Israeli state to offer a sanctuary in Palestine to all Jews has, by its very token of unconditionality, created a precedent for people suspected or guilty of crimes to quickly board a flight to Tel Aviv. So we see this that, you know, people that have no ties to Israel who m may be ethnically Jewish but, you know, don't really lean into that part of their identity if they are convict or are wanted for some kind of crime be it from the u.s somewhere in europe whatever will use this loophole the law of return to fly to israel to avoid justice right going on here guys an unlimited right at the heart of this tendency is the israeli law of return this law would itself be absurd enough in its discrimination for claiming a Jewish right to be in Palestine based on ancestral claims that are two millennia old. Of course, that's one of the big contradictions of this, right? And made more so for denying a right of return to millions of living Palestinians driven out by the Nakba and further Israeli violence and after 1948. And of course, again, this is a hypocrisy we were just discussing, right? Um, the millions of Palestinians driven out of historical Palestine into places like the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, right? Um, they have no, or actually also the um, diaspora of Palestinians. You know, one in three refugees in the world is Palestinian, 
right? Which is just absolutely staggering to even try to wrap your head around. It, 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 it's 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 a testament to the absolute horrors of apartheid and genocide that the Palestinian have Palestinians have been subjected to. The fact that one in three refugees on the fucking planet are Palestinian, right? Um, but beyond that, this reality that any of these people can come to Israel, but you have millions. I mean, some of them just living right across the border in Gaza, unable to come. People that have been driven out of their uh, historic ha- homeland to Egypt, to Jordan. Large number of Jordans are, Jordanians are actually Palestinian, to Lebanon, to the U.S., obviously. None of these people are allowed to come back, but somebody who has never even stepped foot outside of, say, the United States has a right to come to Israel uh, and become a citizen, right? Going on here, guys, getting to some of the logistics of the law. It says, 1954 amendment to the law of return that the wants unlimited right of Jews to become citizens of the Israeli state should exclude persons with a criminal past likely to endanger public welfare. But as we'll see, there's been loopholes around that. And the culture, the political culture uh, and protectionist of quote-unquote Jewish people within the culture of Israel kind of regularly amounts to people flouting this amendment right and as we'll see here um even open laws and in, in, in instances where it's just it's almost like this amendment doesn't even exist right um movement towards rationalizing the most unlimited right of jews to israeli citizenship took a backward step in 1978 prime minister menachem begin out of concern that Jewish defendants could face anti-Semitism abroad, legislated against extraditions in favor of Jews having a right to be t- tried in Israeli courts instead. So pretty big, pretty big loophole, right? Um, so what we're seeing here is this then Prime Minister 1978 using the guise of we are concerned of Jews being persecuted, uh, of anti-Semitism in foreign governments, uh, and the courts in those governments being used to persecute Jews. So with that perceived reality, we are going to make it that any Jewish person being, you know, wanted by the law or authorities anywhere in the world can come to Israel to be tried in Israeli courts instead, which is absolutely insane because these people are not citizens of the country, just completely unhinged, right? Um, The landmark case in the undoing of the 1978 amendment was that of an American teenager, Samuel Scheinbein, along with his friend Aaron Benjamin Needle. He murdered Alfredo Enrique Teo in Maryland in 1977. Pretty crazy here, guys. All three boys were only 17. Scheinbein led the murder before he and Needle cut up and burned Teo's remains to prevent his identification. Once the body was found and suspicions began to mount, Scheinbein's father arranged for Samuel to travel to Tel Aviv and receive an Israeli passport. Needle killed himself in a U.S. prison before facing trial, but in a mammoth legal case, the Israeli authorities, notwithstanding Scheinbein's certain guilt, finally refused his extradition to the United States. Scheinbein was sentenced to 24 years in Israeli jail, where he was afforded such luxuries as weekend breaks and granted multiple entreaties for more comfortable conditions. He finally died in a shootout with prison guards in 2014, just before becoming eligible for parole. Pretty fucking wild story, guys. A little bit more with this section here, guys. It says, Israeli extradition law 2005, undoing the obvious laxity of the 1978 legislation. Israeli law intended to prevent the extradition of Jews to face trial in potentially anti-Semitic states was in the end used by a U.S. citizen of Jewish heritage to evade justice for the murder of a Latina man in America. So, you know, in 2005, um, they tried to undo this, tried tried to close some of these loopholes and stuff like that. But as we'll see, like I was talking about, the culture of this still remains. And Israel is incredibly hesitant to ever extradite its own citizens, but also people that are fleeing the law, fly to Tel Aviv, fly to wherever in Israel. A lot of times, most of the time, um, the Israelis won't even send them back to the um, parent uh, nation, right? says here, guys, if the Scheinbein case prompted some changes, it arguably left much of the raw intact. Scheinbein's father remains in Israel, despite being wanted in the United States for helping his son flee after the murder of Teo. Aiding the escape was only a misdemeanor and so non-extraditable. So this guy that helped the father who helped a fugitive escape justice, a, a murder suspect, a murder fugitive, 
um, he's living, you know, comfortably still in Tel Aviv with no consequences, right? Going on here says, Malka Leifer, a Jewish woman convicted of scores of child sex offenses while running a Jewish school in Melbourne, Australia, over a decade since Australian authorities first saw her return 10 years ago. The Israelis continued to refuse extradition, suggesting that Leifer was mentally unwell and unfit to stand trial. It was only as Israeli tabloids disclosed images of the normal, healthy life Leifer, much like the Tinder Swindler, was living in Israel-Palestine that Australian anger and diplomatic pressure mounted, finally resulting in Leifer's extradition to stand trial for 74 charges of child abuse. So they were literally... And there's many, many cases of this in the Israeli state harboring a, a, a pedophile, a, a child sexual abuser, right? And it looks like they finally extradited her, but it took 10 fucking years, 74 counts of um, child, you know, sex trafficking, child sex abuse, sorry. Um, going on here with this guy's. Legal proceedings in Australia mean Lifer will not stand trial for allegations of child abuse in the West Bank settlement where she lived. So she was also a, a, a settler in the West Bank. I mean, just terrible. You know, she's one of these people not just living in, quote unquote, Israel pro proper, but coming in to live in these occupied settlements in the West Bank that is supposed to be under Palestinian autonomy, but where they go in at gunpoint a lot of time with these militias, kick people out of their homes, take over the homes for themselves, build walls around it, and shit like that. And so this is a, 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 a big piece of this puzzle here, guys, is all these West Bank settlements that you will hear about in the news, and there's always this debate back and forth, especially from mainstream media about, yes, it's against international law, but, like, what are you going to do? Um, a lot of times they will have some of the worst fucking human beings being the ones to perpetuate these settlements, right? Because, obviously, you got to be one of the worst possible fucking human beings to go into a country that isn't your own, kick people out at gunpoint, take it over, plant a flag on it, and be like, this is fucking mine now, right? So a lot of times what you'll see is you'll have um, – You'll have cr criminals, war criminals, um, and in some cases you'll have Israel will green light people being Israeli citizenship, granting them Israeli citizenship even though they're not Jewish because they just want to get what it's really about in Israel, white people in here to kick out these brown Arabs to make this into a white ethno state kind of hidden by the veneer of uh, being a Jewish ethno state, but really it's a white supremacist, a white European state, right? Just like Rhodesia or uh, South Africa, a white settler colony, right? Going on here, um, settlement where she lived 13 years and where the extrajudicial nature of Israeli occupation of Palestinian story no doubt aided the culture of impunity that facilitated her crimes. I mean, none of these settlers that are committing fucking human rights abuses are going to sell her out. But this is the thing, too. Israel, um, you know, refused to extradite her even when she was getting allegations of child abuse in the West Bank. So she fled Israel, or fled Australia, where she had been doing horrific crimes against children, comes to the West Bank. Israel's nice enough to let her, but they don't care. I mean, this is such an inhumane society, a deeply white supremacist, deeply racist, deeply violent, deeply warlike society. It's no surprise that they are allowing child sexual abuse to go on, and they don't give a shit because they don't give a shit about anything else other than occupying this region, being a vassal of the United States, being a, a white settler colony in the Arab world, right? Going on here, guys, says Jewish extremists targeting Palestinians also use Israeli territory to escape the law, often with fewer diplomatic efforts to see justice done. Um, so what we saw here is, um, you know, sex offenders, an example, and I have in this other article more examples of sex offenders being hidden in Israel. Uh, but now we have terrorists. Israel And Israel has a long history of not only perpetuating through its state mechanisms, terrorism, oftentimes on behalf of the United States around the world, particularly in Latin America, uh, financing and training uh, right-wing death squads in Latin America. But then they also will harbor, uh, you know, right-wing or Jewish supremacist terrorists in the country as well, right? 
A French Zionist militant using Israel as a refuge to evade the law was sentenced in absentia in a court in Paris. Gregory Shelley was found guilty of committing concerted harassment campaigns against French Arabs, both Palestinian and non-Palestinian in France. His modus operandi included Kelly making police reports against vulnerable Arab individuals, leading to detentions, raids, and in the case of one elderly Arab man whom Kelly, uh, Shelley, hopefully that's right, cruelly targeted death by heart attack. Joseph Ayachi, another French Zionist, was sentenced to jail in Paris in 2016 for organizing attacks against Muslims and Palestinians, but also escaped justice by quickly boarding a flight to Tel Aviv. These are fucking terrorists, and they are sheltering them and then refusing to extradite them. And as we saw in the case with uh, Sheen Bean, they did give him jail time, 24 years, but they afford him all these luxuries and things like that, right? And I'm not saying it's not a punishment, but he is not getting the level of justice or uh, punishment, rather, uh, that Palestinians would get for, say, throwing a rock at a tank or uh, protesting their inalienable, for their inalienable human rights, right? Absolutely crazy, guys. Moving on here, guys, we have more coverage of, um, you know, white supremacists, Jewish supremacists, terrorists being shielded by Israel. U.S. Israeli citizens Baruch Ben Yosef and Keith Fuchs hiding out in illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Again, another example of these um, criminals being used to perpetuate settler colonialism because, of course, they have some of the worst um, moral compass. They're going to be okay with coming in and kicking people out of homes, murdering people, treating people like subhuman in order to take over and settle the West Bank, right? There they remain wanted for questioning over the kill t- killing in Santa Ana, California, of Palestinian-American anti-racist activist Alex O'Day, murdered in 1985 by a bomb attack on his office. O'Day had worked energetically to the chagrin of his killers against anti-Arab and anti-Palestinian racism in the United States that was then barely beginning to acknowledge its existence, much less act against it. Even in the wake of his death, representatives of the Jewish Defense League with which Fuchs and Ben Yosef have links, felt comfortable slandering O'Day as a terrorist when a statue was erected in his memory in Santa Ana. It faced repeated vandalism. And of course, any of you watching this channel, I'm sure, understand the ways in which the Jewish Defense League, the Anti-Defamation League, obviously APAC, all these different organizations um, masquerade as humans, human rights organizations to protect Jewish people around the world from anti-Semitism, you know, from... Uh, repeating the history of things like say in nazi germany with the holocaust a long history of jewish persecution obviously no one here is to debate that but most of you watching this show probably understand that a lot of these organizations due to the israeli lobby israeli dollars israeli pressure have turned these organizations into bulwarks into defense mechanisms for the israeli state they no longer actually serve the purpose of protecting um, Jewish, uh, the Jewish diaspora uh, from persecution. And as you may have seen, a lot of these organizations will, um, you know, target Jewish Americans, Jewish activists that speak out against Israel and call them anti-Semitic, even though they're Jewish, right? So again, here, guys, another example of a terrorist, of terrorists being sheltered, um, giving safe haven in the Israeli state, right? Um, So that's what we have for this article here, guys. Um, Several examples. And this has been going on, as we uh, can see, from at least the 70s, long before, probably throughout the entire history of Israel. Um, We'll try to keep this video short, like I was saying, guys. But I have another article here that kind of gives you some more examples of this from the cradle. Uh, Hollywood director, latest sexual predator to find refuge in Israel. The state of Israel has for decades served as a safe haven for wanted criminals. Um, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we already know this. This one's from October 4th, 2023. It says, disgraced Hollywood director Brett Ratner, who stands accused of, by multiple women of rape and sexual la- harassment, revealed last week he had relocated to Israel just days after being a special guest of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the UN General Assembly in New York. So not even hiding it. has a little meeting with the fucking Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, one of the most powerful people um, in Israel. And then look at that. Hey, he's like, hey, come on. We'll protect you here in Israel. 
Ratner has followed in the footsteps of other sexual predators who have fled to Israel in recent years, including another Hollywood director, Brian Singer, who moved to Israel several years ago after being accused of rape and sexual assault of several minors. Israel has become a sanctuary for Jewish sexual predators, as well as countless fraudsters, money launderers, uh, and war criminals. Over 60 U.S. citizens accused of pedophilia have successfully fled to Israel in the past few years. And I just want to point out the dichotomy of you have so many right-wingers who their whole spiel is, you know, protecting children from sexual predators when it comes to their re reason or justification for being anti-LGBT, right? And then these same people will vehemently, uh, z zealously, with the with the with the zeal of not only a Christian evangelic evangelicist that believes in the coming of the end of the world when all the Jews end up back in the Promised Land can have will zealously uh, defend Israel and its war crimes, particularly now with what's going on in the Gaza Strip with the fucking carpet bombing genocide. Right? The the of course, of course, right wingers are known for their contradiction. They're fucking reactionaries, right? But just the complete hypocrisy or lack of understanding. In one sentence, they'll preach about anti-LGBT rhetoric and how they got to protect the youth from the evil gays and trans and drag queens. Scary, scary, scary. And then they'll cover flack for Israeli. That is just from the U.S. 60 U.S. citizens have successfully fled to Israel in the past few years. I mean, it's just crazy. But they don't need to make sense. They live in some world where they can have completely contradictory uh, opinions on things, and it seems to make sense. Um, there are about 100 rabbis, teachers, and other figures who have been accused, charged, or convicted of sexual abuse overseas and subsequently found refuge in Israel. Got a particular story here. It says Mexican diplomat Andres Reamer, who stands accused of rape and sexual harassment by over 60 women. After more than two years of dragging their feet, Israeli authorities arrested Reamer on Monday. Again, another example of they'll put it off until public pressure uh, gets so high that they have to do something to make it look like they're trying to deal with this problem, right? Reamer even had a street named after him in the city of Ramat Gran. Uh, Gan, sorry. Crazy. A I gotta ask, like, why would there be a street named after him? I don't. A Mexican diplomat? Like, that doesn't seem... I don't know, man. And, and another... Tying in with this, this is a slight addendum, but the age of consent in Israel is like 16 across the board, right? Um, and there's people in the government right now, and look, I'm not trying to do a whole lecture about this because I don't know everything about it and I don't have sources for it, but still it's pretty disturbing. Uh, there's elements in the Israeli state that want to lower it to 14, right? Um, and when you look at this culture of taking in sexual predators – you know, and then you look at the deeply, like I mentioned earlier, warlike, violent, extremist, racist culture that is Israeli state. I mean, you're looking at not just an Israeli state, but the culture within Israeli society. You can see poll after poll of the deep racism and hate, genocidal hate that Israelis that are predominantly white European in their, um, you know, ancestry – and you couple this with this seemingly deeply s sick or this sort of free pass that they seem to have towards sexual predators. I mean, you're looking at a deeply, deeply fucking sick society, right? Uh, Mexico is still seeking the extradition of the former head of the criminal investigation agency, Thomas Zeron, different case here, guys, who is wanted in connection to the disappearance of 43 students in southwestern Mexico in 2014. So presumably Thomas Zeron... Uh, with some sort of sex trafficker, right? And, and again, these right-wingers are so concerned about sex trafficking and the elites fucking and eating children at their weird party. I mean, th you know, all this wild shit that they go on, and then they'll run this fucking flack for Israel. Ziran is also accused of embezzling over $50 million in torturing suspects. Despite being wanted by Interpol, Ziran has been living in an upscale apartment building in Tel Aviv since late 2019 due to his ties to the Israeli tech sector, including embattled firm NSO Group, makers of Pegasus spyware. Of course, you've heard of the Pe uh, infamous Pegasus spyware used to um, spy on 
everybody, but also foreign heads of state, even allies of the U.S. and Israel. Wild stuff here, guys. Uh, furthermore, Western media reports revealed earlier this year that Israeli authorities are unlikely to extradite Zeran as payback, quote-unquote payback, uh, for Mexico's support of the Palestinian cause and their approval of U.N. inquiries into Israeli war crimes against Palestinians. Um, so that's a reading I have there for you guys. Um, again, like I said, there's been a lot of coverage of the situation in Israel, Palestine. So I thought I would do a, a different perspective on this. I'm not going to be able to keep up with the play by play that's going on. And I'm sure you guys have other indie outlets that you're watching. So I'm not even sure that you needed to need me to do that necessarily. Um, but I wanted to bring this up because while we are seeing this horrifying genocide going in Gaza, as we're seeing these and have been seeing for a while, these horrifyingly disturbing videos of extreme racism and xenophobic hate uh, from Israelis, not just, obviously, of course, we're, we're seeing Israeli officials call for out, out and out genocide, dropping in one guy even dr uh, talking about dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza. So while we're seeing all this hateful, warlike, genocidal rhetoric, I thought it would also be good to show another way in which Israel is a rogue state. Uh, in its hiding of all kinds of criminals, some of the most egregious war, uh, criminals from uh, sex offenders to presumably human traffickers to pedophiles to uh, fraudsters to criminals to Ponzi scheme artists to uh, fucking war criminals. And of course, Israel is going to hide war criminals because everyone in that government is a goddamn war criminal, especially now with what's going on in Gaza. So I thought this would just be some interesting coverage for you guys to provide a different angle, a different perspective on the culture and nature of not only the Israeli state, but of the Israeli um, nation state as a whole, right? Um, so that's really all I have for you guys. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening to the podcast, um, I'm glad to be back here with you guys. I'm looking forward to getting back into the swing of things. Um, let me know if you, hopefully this video came out a little shorter, shorter. Uh, if you prefer these shorter videos, if you want me to keep doing the longer ones, I'm going to try to fit in what I can guys, but I'm excited to be back. Plan on new content coming every week or so at least. Um, don't forget, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash entitled millennials. You can become a patron there for $1 a month. Makes a big difference for me. You guys won't even notice it's gone. PayPal donations, links in the bio there. Greatly appreciated. Um, and if you haven't already, of course, like and subscribe. Um, but as always, guys, it's um, great hanging out with you. And I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Bye.